In the name of the one God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer. Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning again, and welcome to this great season of Epiphany this morning. This, is, of course, is the season where we focus on the dawning of the light of Christ, the light of Emmanuel in our world. That's what, of course, the word epiphany means, right? Appropriately, our gospel this morning means, uh, appropriately, our gospel this morning, I'm sorry, begins allowing us to see how Jesus himself got his start in this world-changing ministry of his, his baptism in the River Jordan. Now, most of you, I suspect, know that a very large part of the church this morning is not celebrating the baptism of Jesus. That's ba they're basically celebrating Epiphany, right? The, in the uh, Orthodox world, this is really the high celebration. Uh, Christmas is no big deal in, in, uh, in, in the Orthodox tradition. It's also true, in, by the way, in South, in South America uh, and in Latin countries. Epiphany is the gift-giving time. Hmm? Somebody? Oh, I just said, oh. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Oh, Learn something every day, right? Right. <laughs> well, today our gospel text calls us to move on with Jesus as he first comes alive to God's calling at the hands of John the Baptist. And this is a great story, so I'll, I'll, I'm going to enjoy sharing this with you and, and talking about it. But I also want to focus this morning on what's happening in this text because I think that this might allow us all to perhaps think a little bit differently and maybe even helpfully about our own baptism into the body of Jesus, the Anointed One. In our text, we meet Jesus down near the Jordan River, where he finds this somewhat wild and crazy prophet, this guy John, who had been drawing crowds from all around the Galilee, all around Judea, and even from Jerusalem. And John's message was clear and dramatic. He's calling God's people, Israel, to get themselves cleaned up, to get themselves ready for what God is about to do in their world. God is about to engage in a cosmic effort to clean up the mess of the world that they've gotten themselves into. Now, that's not the first time that God's done that, and it wouldn't be the last. But this was that time. And in earlier days of Israel's history, beginning as far back as Abraham, God was now like, he, like God had before, about to act on God's behalf of the people, to free them from oppression, from violence, and in this time, to free them from the violence of the Roman Empire. Their task, the people's task, as God's people, was to get themselves ready by sanctifying themselves, by making themselves holy people in the cleansing waters of the Jordan River. And just like God had done in the Exodus and in bringing the people, the people Israel back from Babylon and in their, in the defeat of the corrupt Seleucid king in the, in the Maccabean War, God now was again about to act. That's John's message. That's what's going on. And John's task was to get everybody ready. Now, we should be aware that the Jordan River, in the, especially in the Gospel of Matthew, 
is not just a convenient body of water. The Jordan River is a powerful symbol for the people of God and of God's saving of God's people. And Jesus is now with God's people at the Jordan. So baptism, first of all, is not about individuals. It's about the whole of us. It's about all of us. So how did Jesus come to this scene? Well, we can only kind of guess because, of course, there are years between Jesus' birth and this time when Jesus is obviously an adult. We don't know what's going on with him. So we can only kind of guess. But what we do know is that Jesus was being raised, like a lot of his colleagues and friends, in the midst of the reign of violence and oppression and desperation under the rule of Herod Antipas. Now this is not Herod the Great. That was the guy that was ruling when Jesus was born. This is his son, Herod Antipas. And he ruled as Herod's son in the Galilee. And here the apple didn't fall very far from the tree, let me tell you. Because Herod Antipas was a nasty character. His whole life, Herod's life, Herod Antipas that is, was intended to butter up the Roman Empire in order for them to declare him the king of the Jews, like his father had been. It never happened, by the way. But he did that by turning the whole of Galilee into this lucrative cash cow for the empire. Okay? Stripping the resources from the people, consolidating all the peasant farmland, taking it from them. Okay? And of course, how did you earn a living if you were, if in that day and age, you farmed? If you couldn't farm, how did you earn a living? Ah, so lots of desperation, lots of poverty, lots of, of suffering, all right? He drowned the people in taxation and turned the fishing industry on Lake Kinneret, which was part of the Galilee, right? It's up north, into a state-controlled industry. You know those guys, Peter, James, and John? All right, the people that Jesus called to be his first disciples? Well, they were, of course, fishermen in the fishing village of Capernaum. And how do you think they were dealing with Antipas? They, of course, were bending under Antipas's reign as well, struggling to earn a bare living after paying overwhelming taxes for being, opening his mouth too much and getting himself into the pro process of being a disturber of the peace, Herod's peace, right? So Jesus lived his whole life in the midst of that world. Think about that. I mean, we usually don't think about this, right? But, but this is the real world in which, Her in which Jesus lived. Surely, I would suspect that Jesus was as keenly aware of the pain of his people and his people's desperation and oppression as anybody else. Yeah? Mm -hmm. He lived with it. His family was pov impoverished. His own family. He wasn't this middle class kid going to high school. <laughs> At any rate, Jesus shows up to see what this guy, John, has got to say. Probably heard about him, right? Heard, heard through the grapevine that this guy was down at the Jordan River preaching. So he goes down to check it out. 
And lo and behold, he gets really smitten with John's preaching and taken with the goal that John puts out there of being a part of God's coming revolution in the land. Now, for those of you who think that, the, that, that religion is about privateness and, and it doesn't have anything to do with politics, this ought to cure you of that because it's deeply political, right? Everything about this is political. So we're not sure why John and Jesus had their conversation at the Jordan, and we don't know how they got to know each other. We don't know why John recognized Jesus. That, that, Matthew doesn't tell us that. But Matthew does really want us to know that this Jesus was firmly deciding that he wanted to be a part of this revolutionary call to righteousness and justice. He wanted to be included among his people. Symbolically, he wanted to also join them in crossing symbolically the Jordan River, right, to retake the promised land for the people of God. That's what, that's what John was doing. It was all symbolic, right? And the Jordan was really important for that. Because remember, that's where, that's where they, the people of Israel went, crossed the Jordan, first of all, to enter the Promised Land, right? So as Jesus is stepping into this river, all of Israel's collective memory is being put up to play right before us. And all in all, what Jesus would then continue to do is to recapitulate in his own life. Jesus would recapitulate in his own life, in his own death, in his own ministry, and in his resurrection, his life as the servant of God. Jesus wanted to, and Jesus must, as he says, fulfill all righteousness. As a part of his people, he had to do what they had to do. So John is urging God's people to rethink their circumstances of oppression and desperation. That's what the word repentance here means. It doesn't mean saying you're sorry for something you did wrong. Repentance here means turning around. It means reconsidering, rethinking where you are and who you are. And John's saying, stop thinking of yourselves as desperate victims and start thinking of yourselves as the people of God. So the people needed to turn away from their past abandonment of the God of Israel and turn away from the seductive power of the empire and return to the one who would once again, in faithfulness, save them. Now, maybe that's more history than you wanted to know. I don't think so, though. I think it's important. Because usually we don't hear this, right? And now, what, what we who read the story know, because we know the end of the story, is that Jesus has already been revealed to the reader, to us, the readers of Matthew, as God's Emmanuel, God with us. And we already have heard that Jesus would be the one through whom God would save his people, which is actually what the word, the name, Jesus means. God will save his people. That's what Jesus means. So now, in this story by the River Jordan, we're also attaching the name Jesus. A 
And see, if you're not paying attention, you don't get that, right? So God, again, is going to do something powerful, something transformative, something liberating, because that's what God's, the God of Israel does. God is always saving God's people. And now, after coming up out of the water, we're told that Jesus hears a divine voice of approval. And we're also given this image of seeing this thing that thing looks like a dove. Well, in the ancient world, the dove is a symbol for God's spirit. And so with that, we are confirmed as a reader of this gospel lesson that indeed this is God's Mashiach, God's servant who will save God's people. So before we even meet Jesus as a compassionate healer or as a wise teacher or as a voice of God's justice, we meet him today as God's obedient son of the Father. So what are we to make about this? What, what, why are we spending time doing this, talking about this? Well, as I was thinking about it, one of the things that came to my mind is that I'm sure that all of us in this room are very well aware that the power of the Over the centuries, the church has effectively replaced the message of Jesus, this clear message of the transformative justice and righteousness and reconciling healing with a message that Jesus is the message. That is, we've kind of boiled it down to saying, all you got to do is believe in Jesus, right? All you got to do is believe in Jesus. It'll be, all be okay. Jesus saves. That isn't exactly right. In fact, that's not right at all. Many now see our sacrament of baptism as a more, little more than a kind of a quaint ceremony of membership in the church's club. <laughs> You're joining the club. And some people still want their kids baptized. That's true. We do do that even a little bit today. Not as much as we used to. But when they do want their kids baptized, they hardly ever know why. And you ask them and they just don't know. <laughs> Nothing wrong with any of that, except frankly, what we've done is turned that occasion of baptism, our most holy <coughs> event, our sacrament of baptism, we've turned it into an occasion to have a great party for welcoming a kid. Now, ain't, that's nothing wrong with that. I like parties as much as anybody. But that is exactly not what baptism is about. What we say about baptism is that in baptism, you and I, followers of Jesus, have taken on the role of being a part of this great cosmic movement, which is the life of the body of Christ in the world. You and I are the body of Christ in the world, the body of Jesus. And 
we're the people who continue the work of Jesus wherever that work is to be continued. The work of healing, the work of redeeming, the work of restoring, the work of mending the world. That's our job. And we, like Jesus, must continually make the decision about whether or not we're going to continue to be a part of that great operation of cleanup that God is still doing. We call that operation of cleanup the kingdom of God. Right? It's our vision of, what, of God's dream for the world that is of justice and righteousness and peace and reconciliation. That's our dream because that's God's dream for us. It's our deepest hope. It's our only goal. It's our only reason for existence as a group, as a community. Our only reason. If we're not doing it, we need to go home. Seriously. What Jesus told us is that while we can't remake the world ourselves, that's not our job. I mean, lots of people think they could remake the world and they really made a mess of it, right? <coughs> While we can't remake the world ourselves, neither can God remake the world without us. What baptism says is that we are committing ourselves to living lives that are constantly repenting of our own failures, of our own turnings away, of our own seduction, and our own buying into the system. turning away from all that destructive power of our world to stand on the side of God's justice, to stand on the side of God's reconciliation, to stand among God's people everywhere for healing, for the healing of God's beloved broken world. We are, as Jesus' people, called to live in that hope that God's reign is in fact dawning and it does dawn with us. And we are to strive to see that God's world is being mended and made whole as Jesus did. Now we all know that the end of Jesus' story is right here at the beginning, isn't it? I mean, we read about it in the book of Acts this morning. Jesus, like John, cost, it cost his life to do the work that he did. Right? Mm -hmm. That's what happened. And as I said last week, taking this Jesus stuff seriously can really be dangerous. even and especially, I think, in our world. But perhaps the world, <clears throat> if the world begins to see or begins to see in us as followers of Jesus, living out serious lives of following the message and the ministry of Jesus, the church might again start being a community that regains a hearing in our suffering world. People might begin to start paying attention. Where is the love? Where is the healing? Where is the reconciling care needed in our world? Where might it desperately be needed in this community of Scotts Valley?
as we follow Jesus through this epiphany season, that will be the question we will constantly be forced to ask. Will we, like Jesus, take up God's call and take up our own baptismal vow 